Kia ora, talofa, namaste, chur, haere mai, and welcome to this week's Niche Cash Variety Show, where we deliver a smorgasbord of buffet, a mean feed of Aotearoa sporting excellence. Prior to this, we have recorded our extra podcast for the Patreon Fano, who support the Niche Cash, and you can join the Patreon Fano, patreon.com forward slash el niche cash it is the best way to support the niche cash directly so big it up to all the patreon whanau and there is the extra podcast on the patreon feed as well every monday and friday evening we deliver an email banger via substack the niche cash.substack.com or the regular niche cash bullkaka into your email inbox as well as extra yarns last few emails the wildcard has been doing uh, plenty of football transfers for the flying kiwis from aotearoa so just some extra goodness in the email and there's extra goodness in the patreon podcast as well so shout out to the patreon whanau shout out to everyone who's signed up to our email list every monday and friday evening as well and shout out to everyone reading kiwi sporting excellence at the niche cache the niche dash cache.com we always start our podcast with a dose of mindfulness. Wobbly wild card. Can you please tickle our spiritual Shoshin antenna? That I can. I was actually trying to remember what the word Shoshin was the other day. I was um, the, the beginner's mindset thing. I was trying to remember what the word was and I forgot it. And then you just said it. So that, um, there you go. It's just the ask and ye shall receive. Um, not sure who I asked, but still, my mindfulness here is a little bit of a frisky one because I don't actually remember. I, I found it written down, and I'm like, I was going to delete it from my notes, and I was like, actually, that's a that's a good one. I don't remember why I wrote it or who said it, but the quote is, "Zen is liberation from time." Zen is liberation from time. That's a beautiful note. And we are pressed for time for this podcast. A little bit. So we're not going to do a deep exploration or try and suss that. And that's actually a beautiful one. I don't think that needs a whole lot more to be said. Like it's incredibly practical as well. It's beautiful. What does it say it again? Zen is? Zen is liberation from time. Zen is liberation from time. Liberation just basically means freedom from time yeah, as well free of i i yeah um doing google translates on liberato kakache's um, move to empoli in, in italy this morning on twitter um involved a lot of like the liberato bit would be translated along with the words like his name would get translated so it would say like freedom kakache or um, uh, liberated kakache things like that and it's, it's kind of funny when you think about him having just been sold but yeah liberation from time not worrying about time not thinking of things in like the sequential manner and planning ahead to the future worrying about the past just living in the moment i suppose if you're only ever in the moment if there is only the present moment which is true but we always forget that right then you are liberated for time in your own way aren't you because you're no longer a, like you're no longer like a prisoner of the the constant like rolling on of like seconds passing minutes passing hours passing did i do enough in that hour did i achieve what i planned to like you just you're just free you're just it's open-ended right you're just summarizing it there perfectly i uh, don't need to say anything else that's beautiful we shall begin the variety show with some i believe you're going hot takey diving into yeah, the chili bin of hot takes there as well so we're going to go double banger with the hot takes to start the show, dipping into our 1332 Radio Sport Chili Bin. We got a caller on the dial. What bullshit are you going to spin here, Wildcard? Uh, no bullshit, no, none whatsoever right here. This is, um, which reminds me as well, just to spin these things together. At least, I don't know if this is, for, like, at least according to Google and various things that I've seen like that, one of Joe Bell's middle names is Zen. And I believe Nando Pineker also has a middle name of Zen. I don't know if it means something. Like he's of Dutch heritage. I don't know if that means something different in Dutch. But Joe Bell is born um, of English parents. So um, I think he it's like timeless. Joe Zen, Robert Bell. So yeah. So you've got Zen is liberation from time, right? Liberation with the Liberato Kakache link. And then Zen with the Joe Bell link. Both of them potentially 
getting significant transfers today. We're doing this just as the um, transfer deadline is passing, but it sounds like Joe Bell probably heading to Bronby in, um, in Denmark. Um, it's touch and go with the deadline at the moment, so I, I, won't, I won't speak any further on that. What I will say is that Joe Bell not playing for the All Whites against Jordan the other day really highlighted to me what I have decided to include as my hot take, which I don't actually think is even that hot, but it will sound very hot, uh, which is that Joe Bell is the All Whites' most important player. Um, doesn't mean he's the best player. Chris Wood is the best player. Chris Wood plays for Newcastle, most expensive Premier League player aged over 30 in terms of transfer fee. Um, scores 10 plus goals every season in the, you know, one of the toughest leagues on the planet. Chris Wood is the best player, but Joe Bell is the most important player. When you think about Chris Wood, he requires a certain amount of service. You got to, he's this kind of striker who isn't just going to do a most seller and dribble through three players and score by himself. Um, he needs good balls into the area. He needs, he needs, yeah, you got, you got to feed the woodsman if you want him to be successful. He's going to work his ass off and do all those other things, but to get the best out of him requires others chipping in around him. Um, Winston Reed also would be in a similar category when fully fit, which, you know, fingers crossed he seems to be at the moment. Um, but Winston Reed is a defender. And the dark arts of defending involve, like, you, you can have the best, like, like, Alessandro Nestor and Fabio Cannavaro as your um, center backs. But if you've got a fullback who's like standing a meter behind everyone and playing a striker on side, doesn't really matter who those center backs are. The, the guys through on goal going to probably score. Like um, defense is really, really um, those, like those individual moments matter, being able to win tackles and headers and all those things. But it's also a lot to do with defending as a unit, um, keeping that back line structured and, and things like that. So um, Considering all those, I think Joe Bell is the player that the All Whites can least afford to lose. And we saw what it looked like without him against Jordan, where they didn't quite control the ball. They weren't able to progress um, and like a good position in the back, but weren't able to progress that into attack nicely. Um, Bell is a great defensive midfielder, excellent passer, good set piece player, um, great energy, leader on the field. All these things, everywhere he goes, his team's overachieved. You know, I was looking at the trends of him um, in his last year in, in university. His team made the NCAA final, lost on penalties. Um, he was part of a, a, um, a New Zealand under-20s team that made it into the knockouts and lost on penalties to Colombia. He was part of the Olympic team, made it into the knockouts, also lost on penalties to Japan. Um, Joe Bell, I think, scored in the shootout against uh, for Virginia in the college one. Um, missed in the shootout for the 20s, didn't take a penalty in the shootout for the Olympics. So um, irrelevant of that. But he's he's part of teams. And let's not forget Viking last season, best finish for 14 years. And he was one of the very best players in the um, Eredivisie in, in Norway. Um, not the Eredivisie, the Elite Serien. Um, everywhere he goes, his team's overachieved. The All-Whites are hopefully going to be like cramming in some of that Joe Bell magic as well. Uh, it's, it's not a coincidence. Like, we're looking at what they look like without like i just think having a proper all-round like pure central midfielder is kind of the most important um position on the park if you want to be able to control the game joe bell therefore playing at the level that he is as consistently as he does joe bell always the most important player i don't think you'd ever hear joe bell mentioned as the most important always player in the mainstream media here in Aotearoa, and I don't believe you'll ever hear the following statement from a drunk talkback caller or the mainstream media in Aotearoa, because I believe Wildcard, Sophie Devine, and Lydia Ko are the most powerful Aotearoa sporting wahine right now. Sophie Devine, she won the Big Bash League just a few months ago with the Perth Scorchers. Now she has won the Super Smash with the Wellington Blaze. It's the first time Sophie Devine has done the T20 double. Uh, we did have Maddie Green and Amelia Kerr win the Women's Big Bash League with Brisbane Heat. And then Wellington, um, they just won one of their four out of five, you know, Super Smash titles in the last five years. No biggie. But Maddie Green and Amelia Kerr have already done the T20 double. Sophie Devine has now done the T20 double. Massive innings in the final for the Wellington Blaze, banging sixes, also just bowling perfect seam deliveries that nibble around. Sophie Devine is a cricketing beast. She doesn't look like a freak. She's not super tall. She's not too super explosive. Like you can't, she's not super muscly, muscly. 
Um, she doesn't resemble a sporting freak, but she's the most powerful hitter in women's cricket. She's a fantastic bowler. She's a champion. She's got the champion winning mindset. She's a good leader. And big it up to Sophie Devine, superstar of the summer so far. Women's Big Bash League champion, Super Smash champion. And that is right on par with Lydia Ko, who just won the Gainsbridge LPGA Tour. Um, she, her, her best friend, Danielle Kang, best friend in the LPGA, she won the event last weekend when Lydia Ko came 10th, which is a great sign for Lydia Ko because they're friends. This weekend, Lydia Ko was first, Danielle Kang was second. So they are in great form, but Lydia Ko, she finished last year with seven top 10 finishes in her last nine tournaments. That has now been extended to nine top 10 finishes in her last 11 tournaments, which basically means that Lydia Ko stays in the top 10 of the best women's golf tour in the world which makes Lydia Ko one of the best female golfers in the world, and she is holding it down. She doesn't really play badly anymore. She's just consistently good. She was excellent again at the Gainbridge uh, LPGA Tour event. And if we stretch this back to last year, she finished last year in fantastic form. She took a little break over the summer, let Sophie Devine take the, uh, the glamour. Women's Big Bash League champion, Super Smash champion. And then Lydia Ko has swung back around in hot fashion to start 2022. They are representing Aotearoa to the maximum. They are dominant forces. They are consistently, consistently excellent. And it's a beautiful thing to be a part of covering. Let's get a bit statistical here, Wildcard. Can you please offer us a statistic to set the scene? Offer some context, incite us. That I can. Um, this is a stat which I don't really have a like immense amount of context for a little bit, but it's just that since I heard it, I can't get it out of my head. It's just like what an achievement this is. Um, so there's the Milrose games going on over the weekend in New York State. Um, this is an athletic sort of track meet, mostly like sort of Americans or American based folks there, but you know, a bit of a bit of an international context to it. Um, Nick Willis, who obviously lives in America, based in America. He was running there, ran in the mile, aged 38 years old, and came in with a time of, uh, where are we? Um, time of three minutes, 59 seconds, 59.71 seconds. So snuck in under that four minute barrier. This is the 20th consecutive year that Nick Willis has run a sub four minute mile the 20th consecutive year like he's 38 years old now he's still like you know he's not he's not running at the olympic medalist um pace that he once did but 20 years in a row running a sub four minute mile is insane um i just can't get over like the longevity of that the uh, i will say the mile is kind of like um because you know at the olympics it's the 1500 meters and the mile obviously isn't 1500 meters, it's 1600 meters, 1 1.6 miles per kilometer. So it's kind of an antiquated um, race. It's like, it's not run necessarily everywhere. And when it is, it's sort of just because of the, because um, it used to be the big thing and be, getting under that, because it's four clean laps of a 400 meter track. Um, so it used to be that like, like back in the first half of the 20th century, the four minute mile was like this elusive thing. It was just like, um, the dream of runners could we is it possible to even do this um it was roger bannister an englishman 1954 first man to run uh, to run a sub four minute um mile uh john walker of new zealand obviously um the the famous john walker was the first man to run under three minutes 50 so there's a sneaky little uh Aotearoa link there as well but yeah um america obviously still like their um still like their imperial system over the metric system so they still run a lot of miles and stuff he did also run at 1500 meters in about um i didn't see what the time was but he finished ninth in both of these races uh nick willis at this meet but yeah 20 consecutive years of running um i think he's done this is the 63rd time in his career overall that he's run a sub four minute mile 20 years in a row he's done it um that's just like that's just nuts to me to think to think of that level of longevity and to still be 
yeah, still be cranking them out at this stage in his career is pretty crazy and probably adds to why Nick Willis is one of the more, and he's a, he's like, he's a household name. He's a heralded sports, um, you know, achiever, but I wrote a bit about Michael Venus and how he's kind of an underrated Kiwi sportsman on account of being like a doubles tennis player rather than a singles out in front in the spotlight. Um, on the Friday email, did a little bit on Nick Willis in the Monday email. Feels like those two guys are in similar categories of just being underrated Kiwi sportsmen for what they've achieved and for how like consistently and how often they've achieved it. Beauty, I'm going into the Super Smash Blokes final. We're a couple of lads, a couple, a few, a few lads from Hamilton were no a couple of lads from Hamilton were exceptional in the final, but there's a few lads from Hamilton who are exceptional throughout the Super Smash. You would have heard of this dude, Mitchell Santner. He smacked 92 runs, not out at a strike rate of 234 boundaries, fours, and nine sixes. For Mitchell Santner in the Super Smash, he scored 158 runs at a strike rate of 188, which was the highest batting strike rate for Northern Districts of their notable batsmen. And he also took a handy eight wickets and an RPO of 6.66 and a strike rate of 13.5, which is all exceptional. You might not have heard, though, about two bowlers from Hamilton, the first of which is Anurag Verma, who didn't actually take a wicket in the uh, semifinal, but he did finish the Super Smash as... Uh, one of the best seamers in the Super Smash with 14 wickets, RPO of 7.3, and strike rate of 12.7. So Verma's strike rate with the bowl, ball was 12.7. Santner's was 13.5. So shout out Anurag Verma. He was consistently excellent throughout the Super Smash. Hamilton born and raised, like Mitchell Santner, like Northern District's best bowler of the Super Smash, Joe Walker, off spinner, 16 wickets, RPO of 6.67, 6 and a strike rate of 11.6. So compare Joe Walker's strike rate, 11.6, Verma's strike rate, 12.7, Santner's strike rate, 13.5. And you've got three exceptional cricketers for Northern Districts from Hamilton. They won the Super Smash final in Hamilton. And they've all been uh, fairly decent. I'd also suggest Joe Walker might be the biggest ripper of a cricket ball as a finger spinner. We trust the leggies, get lots of turn, lots of rip on the deliveries. When you watch Joe Walker bowl, I don't think there's any other finger spinners in Aotearoa who turn the ball as much as Joseph Walker. Maybe Ajaz Patel, but he's an international test bowler. Um, and then you've got Joe Walker for sure, um, at least second, maybe first, because he gives it a fair freaking rip. So shout out Joe Walker and shout out to the three lads from Hamilton. Um, obviously, Northern have more lads from Hamilton, Scott Kugeline. Uh, I think Peter Bocock played a game as well. We have Freddie Walker, um, younger brother of Joe Walker. But Joe Walker, leading bowler for Northern Districts in the Super Smash. Anurag Verma, excellent white ball bowler. For the northern districts and of course mitchell santner banging sixes tidy bowling nice weekend for hamilton shout out to hamilton let's go deep into the mangroves here wild card where i believe you have found some wellington phoenix wahine i have and i've been looking for signs of progress for the wahinex um i think also I, i'm not they're both from the waikato region i assume they're from hamilton they both play for hamilton um Hamilton Wanderers, but just to tie it into your, your Tron bit as well, um, Grace Wisniewski and Kelly Brown, both um, both uh, chuck them on the, the wider Hamilton sporting um, realms. David Naika? Yes. Yeah, Chris Wood? Out of Hamilton for a long time. Chris Wood played in, um, yep, Chris Wood grew up in Hamilton, didn't he? He Ledger played Walker, a little bit in, um, uh, from the Waikato region. I don't know if it's Hamilton or not, but the wider Waikato, if you're I got up Waikato. Um, yeah. There was an interview with Valence Tafare, Waikato rugby union player who was signed with the Redcliffe Dolphins. Shout out to him as well. Any other Waikato Hamilton love here? 
Tim Seifert, it's obvious. I think he's from Cambridge, the Waikato region as well, part of that northern yeah. team. Yeah, there's a there's well, there's Ross, quite a few footballers who, lives who in spent Hamilton. some time at yeah. Ross Taylor lives in Hamilton for sure. Um, quite a few footballers who spent time at like Waibop and stuff earlier. Like uh, Marco Rojas did briefly. Some of the Ole guys did, but that was because Ole had a link up for a while there. But I don't know how Hamiltonian any of them are, but I. I'm sure I could do some more research and, and pull up a few. But anyway, as to Grace Wodneski right now, um, yeah, looking for signs of progress with the uh, Welly Next Wahine. And I thought like the attacking side would be the best. Well, like, you know, they've scored four goals in their last three games after scoring, uh, I think, one in their first um, one, two, three, four, five, six games. So obviously there's some progress there, but um, can't find XG stats for, for women's football in Australia, at least not yet. Um, and like shot totals and shots on targets and things like that didn't really like tell the story. Um, they had 10 shots, five on target in their very first game, the draw against Western Sydney, and they haven't had more than 10 or more than five in any game since. So it's not like I was hoping for just a nice, easy, like trending upwards kind of graph there with those numbers, but not so much. A little bit in the positions. They have had some more possession lately. Um, but as I say, like it's, um, I would have preferred some nice, like, uh, XG stats or something because a shot on target which the keeper dies like, going top corner keeper dies tips it around the corner best save you've ever seen counts as a one shot on target same as like a tame miss hit that dribbles straight at the goalkeeper and they bend down to pick it up with heaps of time um, both count as a shot on target so there's, there's scales to these things and don't quite have the things for that um, and also I think also, when you look at like the progress as well with some of the stats it's clouded by the fact that earlier on in the season they played like, you know, Sydney twice in their first five games, Melbourne City after that, like two of the very best teams and got smoked by them. Um, however, like there was a winnable game against Perth last night that was played. They were 2-1 up with 10 minutes to go, ended up losing 3-2, another heartbreaker. Um, and like, you know, Grace Jale was trying to like hold back the emotions having to be interviewed straight after. She's just like, yeah, it sucks. You know, we're, we're trying so hard. We're getting so close and we're just not quite getting the results. Um, and that's true. And I think when you've lost eight games in a row, I suspect a lot of like the um, surface uh, viewing neutrals are probably just feeling like things are just getting away, losing interest, et cetera, et cetera. There have been signs of progress. So as I say, like uh, if you look at, um, if you look at their halftime scores, um, like even their game two against Newcastle, they lost 5 1. They were only 1 0 down at half time. You know, they were, um, if their games had ended, they are a bit of a um, first half team in general because they're a pressing team. They put a lot of energy in. You've seen them fade in most games down the stretch. They don't quite have the energy at the end and they've conceded a few too many late goals. Um, the 3 2 loss to Perth for sure. The, the late penalty they conceded against Brisbane to lose that one a couple games ago. Um, I think after an hour is gone, they were. They were nil all against Adelaide last week. So if their games had finished at half time, they would have one, two, three draws, a win, and uh, two one nil defeats out of nine games. So you see there's like, um, and a few of those are more recently as well. Like their last three games, they've been up two one at half time, nil all at half time, up two one at half time. Some of this again is playing easier teams down the sort of little last three games, but also, you're seeing them capitalize a little bit better. If their games had finished after 60 minutes, they would have uh, one, two, three, four draws and one win with a couple of heavy defeats that you know Sydney and Melbourne City smoked them in the first half. If their games had finished after 80 minutes, they would have one draw, two draw, three draws, three draws and a win. As it happens, their games finish after 90 minutes. They have one draw, no wins, and eight defeats. But you can see, like, they're, they're pushing further and further and deeper into the games. I think when I look at some of their defensive stats as well, because I do want to write about this um, before they play again on Friday night. So I'll try to do that tomorrow, that article. But you can, you can definitely see ways in which they are getting, like, the, it's, it's as heartbreaking as it is to see them, like, concede twice in the last 10 minutes lose another game where they're so close to getting a positive result they're getting closer and closer and closer like they are learning lessons they are holding in these games longer um these defeats don't necessarily have to like break them as a team they can be like the the um the lessons that they need to learn in order to not 
cough these away next time. Like the, the, the progress is still there. The same thing is true as it has been the whole way through the season where results are secondary. So seeing the team make improvements week on week on week and being 2-1 up with 10 minutes to go against Perth, that's an improvement. Like that's a step up. That's a sign of progress. That's what we're looking for. Today is the 1st of February. And I am going to set the scene for February here deep in the mangroves um, on my sporting beat because it's quite a funky period. We have UFC 271 on February 13th. And I think it might be 14th, the Sunday New Zealand time. This is where Israel Desanya is fighting Robert Whitaker. We also have Carlos Ulberg is in his second UFC fight. And we also have Mike Blood Diamond Mateta in his UFC debut. Blood Diamond, I think he's won King in the Ring a few times and he is making his UFC debut. So that is UFC 271 on the weekend of the 13th. Uh, we also have the White Ferns are starting their ODI series against India. I think they start with a T20, a lone T20. That is on the 9th of February. We have the Black Caps Test versus South Africa on the 17th of February. Meanwhile, we have Halliburton Johnston Shield women's one day cricket happening. We have Ford Trophy cricket happening. We have Plunkett Shield cricket happening throughout February. Rugby league. We have the NRL women competition featuring an absolute truckload of Aotearoa Wahine. That is starting on the 27th of February, later in February. Also starting later in February, we have the Malmeninga Cup which is under 18s up in Queensland. Early in February, though, we have SG Ball starting on the 5th this weekend. And SG Ball in New South Wales is now under 19s. So those competitions are important to me because that's where we learn about the Kiwi NRL takeover. That's where a lot of Aotearoa uh, Kiwi NRL juniors are starting out the NRL journeys, freshly recruited from Aotearoa, or they've been there for a year or two. So up in Queensland, we're dealing with a lot of Gold Coast Titans. We're dealing with a lot of Brisbane Broncos, Cowboys Juniors. And then obviously New South Wales, you've got all the NRL clubs in New South Wales with their junior teams as well. So we've got a lot of cricket. We've got rugby league starting, juniors and women. You might want to catch the uh, competition up in Auckland. You've got the Sean Johnson Shield or Cup. You've got the Dean Bell um, Shield or Cup as well. Those squads were announced on Friday. Those are under 16 and under 18s, and they have a couple of na recognizable names from the World, Sev uh, World fucking Sevens competition, whatever the fuck it is that we had last weekend. Players from that are competing in the... Uh, Sean Johnson and Dean Bell competitions as well. So there's a lot of rugby leagues starting to happen in February. We've got a massive UFC card. We've got the White Ferns. Remember, they have a World Cup later on in the summer in March. We've got a Black Caps versus South Africa, which is a super funky test series. And of course, a whole lot of domestic cricket. So, if, you know, busy period during January. You weren't really tapped into Aotearoa sport. Don't worry, because the shit really kicks off as we get into February. And that is where a lot of the Aotearoa sporting funk is to be found. Question time here. Chuck, on some, chuck on some football fans games as well in February. When, when are they? Both the Phoenix you got teams. a date? Um, uh, let me check. Um, When's the second All-Whites game? Second All-Whites game is overnight tonight, um, Wednesday right. morning at 4 a.m., um, football fans play Iceland on the 18th of February, United States on the 21st, and Czech Republic on the 24th. Oh, nice mix of games as well. Times. Like It is, really. Good it's, USA it's the one really tough one and a couple of winnables, yeah. Beauty. Cool. Anything else happening in February? Um, it's flying Kiwi stuff ain't slowing down. A few teams, a couple of players in particular, will be starting for new clubs as well. Um, Chris Wood's relegation quest at Newcastle. We'll be ramping up some more. Um, of course, the, we've got the NBL, Australian NBL. We've got the A League, W League. A Leagues. Yep. Holy Plenty. guacamole. Absolutely stacked. Right now, yeah. Ross Taylor's batting for Central Districts as we speak. Fucking sporting heaven. Shout out to life. Question time here, Wildcard. You, uh, I'll go first. Let me ask you this question. We don't need a uh, super duper deep dive into. 
Sean Marks running the Brooklyn Nets. But I am curious, Wildcard, because you rightfully, you know, big up to Aotearoa, Sean Marks, GM of the Brooklyn Nets. He's a Kiwi, so you're standing up for the Kiwi, you know, good mahi. Ascend, assembling the Brooklyn Nets, you know, getting a couple of superstars into the mix, turning the Brooklyn Nets from a super, I'm saying super a lot there, turning the Brooklyn Nets from a very Kiwi type of team, you know, developing from within, building from within, not many superstars, flipping that into a very superstar um, dependent team. So I'm curious now, Wildcard, how are you assessing the Sean Mark situation given these factors? Kyrie Irving, part-time player. We've got speculation around James Harden as well. Will he stay with the Brooklyn Nets? Will he move? He's a uh, pretty good basketball player. And of course, you know, Kevin Durant, he's not, he's not very high maintenance. He's just there to play basketball. But then we have this other situation, well cut, where the NR NBA salary cap is $112 million and 414 grand the brooklyn nets payroll is apparently 169 million the salary cap is 112 million and remember shoshin mentality we're learning here so the nba if you're over the salary cap you just pay the luxury tax you don't have the darkest day in australian sport where the melbourne storm are fucking <laughs> throwing up as being the devil no, you just pay more money. So I think that's something the NRL could work towards. If you go over the salary cap, your owner just fucking pays more money and it escalates. It gets worse and worse until you realize, I can't afford this. Let's get back under the salary cap. Instead of wiping away premierships and making a big drama, why don't you just have a tax? Duh. But that's the NRL. And the point here, Wildcard, is that Brooklyn Nets are massively over the NBA salary cap and they might, they have a very wealthy owner who might not care. He might be willing to pay the luxury tax. So we have Sean Marks overseeing all of that. And for context, Stephen Adams is the highest paid player on the Memphis Grizzlies. And the Memphis Grizzlies salary cap or salary payroll is only 97 million. Brooklyn Nets, 169 million wildcard. Shout out to Stephen Adams and the Memphis Grizzlies. We love the, uh, the duo. How are you assessing Sean Marks as GM of the Brooklyn Nets? Uh, yeah. So, do you know? Um, do you know the the Chinese website Alibaba? I know of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you know of it? Well, the guy who co-founded it and is like the vice chairman, um, he's the guy who owns the Brooklyn Nets. So there's there's no shortage of money um, when it comes to paying the luxury tax. I think that's less of a GM's decision. Well, it's obviously not. Uh, yeah well i mean the gm is signing players but he's not signing players above the tax if the owner isn't willing to and hasn't agreed to pay it um so i i think that's if he's doing that that's the owner who's allowed that so i don't think sean marks can can be culpable or anything for um for whatever consequences that might have um i will admit it's been the, the, that beat's been a lot less fun this year, partly because it feels like they've done the work. Like to get to this point, everything was building towards the where they can be a championship contending team. Now they're there. It's not like he's wrangling and finagling and making like sneaky, clever moves. Um, also means, and this was the transition of like last year in particular, um, kind of had to throw out a lot of the stuff they did to get them to that point in order to then take them to the next point where they hope they could challenge for the titles. And unfortunately, there has been some yeah flip side with that where um, I think with Harden, it's been injuries as much as anything. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about off-court stuff with them quite yet, at least not for this season. Um, getting the off-season, anything's go, as we know how this works in the NBA. Um, the Kyrie Irving stuff's been a pain in the ass, though. And initially, really commendable, um, like hard-nosed response be like nah bro if you can't if you can only play half the games you might as well not play any of them um we got you know two games to win here then they started getting a bunch of COVID cases and injuries and stuff like that and they had called, basically called him back because i think the players got to the point where they're like bro we need him like even if he's only available half the time we just don't we don't have the the bodies otherwise um so there's a little bit of a compromise on that and there's been a lot of compromises in the last year and a half since the durant irving era began 
So that has been like a bit sneaky. But if you just step back a little bit further and look at it from the lens of they're in a they're in win now mode. It is all win now mode. Um, everything is done is about maximizing the chances of winning right now. Um, I think. I think he can, you know, he's still, there's, there's still a very solid job being done here. Um, it's just, it's no longer really about the GM. Um, interesting when you get to, yeah, off season, you start worrying about some of these decisions to, can we keep the team together? Who wants to go and get paid somewhere else? Because everyone else is, everyone outside the big three is taking pay cuts to be where they are. Um, lots of those little sneaky situations where Sean Marks will come back into the mix. But I think when you get a, when a GM of a team gets that team towards where they're like, championship contenders it stops really being about them but there is a trade deadline coming up so there might be some sneaky interesting things but yeah i think sean marks definitely outside of the Kyrie irving stuff initially at the start of the season really does feel like he's kind of faded into the background but i think he kind of probably prefers it that way i think it's all about the gm i think it's all about sean marks and how he tinkers with the roster how he you know manipulates the yeah. roster how he gets people engaged how he, you know how how Sean Marks, given all the nifty moves he made, explained by yourself prior to this point, how he then pr applies his niftiness to dealing with the current situation, I think it's going to be fascinating. And while, yeah, they might be completely fine paying the luxury tax, I think Sean Marks still is going to apply his niftiness to that situation somehow. So I'm more asking from a fascinating, there's a, there's a, tricky puzzle ahead of sean marks and sean marks has proven himself to be a very crafty operator as most kiwis are and now how he figures out this jigsaw puzzle it's fun i reckon it's really fun your question yeah and and like the sneaky moves that he might make at trade deadline we often see those guys becoming crucial like that all the contenders are trying to pick up players at this point as well so yeah i think he will he will have a little bit of a, a focus um my question is a nice simple one. Um, come to the end of the Super Smash season, who would you consider your breakthrough players? I think one is quite easy based off the final is Cartina Clark. He's been, he actually um, really popped on my radar. I think it was last summer after some Ford Trophy games, just watching him on YouTube and seeing his stats. And he was, he looked like a very good young batsman. And we also saw him in the Super Smash last summer. He only played like, well, he didn't play, he played like, yeah, he did play like seven or eight games, but he did miss a large chunk due to injury. And he, three of his last four games, I think, were against Canterbury and he scored a lot of runs against Canterbury. But it was more than knocking the final. Um, on a big stage, he would have had some, you know, he's say, I think he's from Counties Manukau, south of Auckland, on the northern Waikato border um so you know quick trip for the Fano from down to hamilton as well so it might have been a home game for him and his Fano. he strikes the ball incredibly well but it was how he stood up in a final from ball one first over and sh and showed no fear in what he was doing on the biggest stage on the biggest domestic cricket stage so Cartini clark great striker of a cricket ball great fielder um, him and Eden Carson are definitely my favorite domestic cricketers, especially in the Super Smash. So shout out to Kartini Clark and tap in over the Ford Trophy with what Kartini Clark gets up to. I don't think he's going to play too much Plunkett Shield, but he'll definitely be in their Ford Trophy lineup. And then I've gone with the entire Otago Sparks, like young crew. They made the final this year. They lost the final to Wellington. Wellington were far better. Um, but from season to season, last season to this season, Otago Sparks' young players all just reached a, a new level. Eden Carson, Sophie Oldershaw, um, Molly Lowe, Emma Black. There was also Polly Inglis opening the batting. All five of those players, like, they were getting smashed in Super Smash games last summer. And now here they are, certifiably part of the best young uh, female cricketers in Aotearoa and part of an Otago Sparks team that reached the final. Otago Sparks wouldn't have reached the final without their young players. We can definitely say, yeah, shout out Susie Bates, shout out Katie Martin, shout out Hayley Jensen, shout out Kate Ibrahim. But they had 
four young bowlers among the best bowlers. Polly Inglis was among the best batters as well. So that whole young crew at the Otago Sparks were, we'll go with them as breakout gang, as well as Carsten Clark, breakout blokes player. But a musical jam to finish here, Wildcard. I'm going to chuck out um, a project from Christoph Altruento and Lucky Lance. To uh, Auckland artists, Al Truento is like a, a dub kind of DJ production guru type of dude. And Lucky Lance is, first heard Lucky Lance is part of some early homebrew. And then he branched off with Has Beats and Tony T's for Team Dynamite. And they released a EP by the name of the 25th of January. And it's just by all accounts, they just went up north, deep in the bush, and recorded this project. Christoph Altruento on the production, Lucky Lance on the rhymes, and rhymes slash spiritual guidance. Like Lucky Lance is just fucking, you listen to this and you're just, it's one of those projects where you're just, the, the music brings you in alignment with spiritual energy and spirituality as well as being a fucking funky musical project as well. So big it up to that. Big up to Aotearoa Music, because the 25th of January EP from Christoph Altruento and Lucky Lance is pure Aotearoa music. Pura vida. Your jams. There you go. Um, confirmation hot off the wire that Joe Zen Robert Bell's move to Danish club Bromby has been confirmed. Um, there you go. Speaking of spiritual guidance, he literally has the name Zen and is <laughs> it's one of his middle names. Uh, as for music, I don't want to just repeat the same albums that I've um, new stuff that I've been naming the last two weeks um, going around like Cat Power and Garcia Peoples and um, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I won't do that. I'll, I'll be honest and say probably what I listened to the most of the last week was um, – Neil Young, which is nice and timely, been in, the, been in the news a whole lot recently. Um, it's been a great week for someone who doesn't use Spotify and is a Neil Young fan. I'll, I'll say that much. I haven't quite got to the point where I have to like dig up my old CDs and see what I can find, although there'd definitely be a few Neil ones there. But um, shout out to the to the humble MP3. Yeah, it's still it's still hanging in there in 2022. Had a big resurgence after Spotify dropped uh, like four billion dollars or whatever the hell. In, in like share worth over the last couple of weeks um those streaming services do actually bugger all for artists so it's nice to know that um every now and then the artists get to push back they got neil young any yeah. fresh tunes any new anything new on your radar uh there is actually a new neil young album that i talked about a couple of weeks ago but no like, as i say i've mostly just the new stuff i've been listening to has been like that garcia people's album i think's probably got the most spins um but i talked about that last week i do having listened to it closer like the similar thing to last their last album where it felt like they were going a little bit more like proggier here the first song sounds like a, a richard thompson tune which is amazing rest of the album i don't think quite lives up to the excellence of that that first track but still a very solid album by just one of the best like jam bands out there all they got to do is just like get all those dudes in a, in a room together and start playing and magic happens so that's the that's the ideal when it comes to jamming out they're they're pretty good at getting that on record but yeah their live stuff where they expand things better is is even better so did you, uh, did you catch band. that new denzel curry track uh yeah walking Walkin it's called i haven't listened to it yet oh, but it's fucking I, I shall do i shall do it's a beauty it's an absolute beauty boom that's the variety show pick it up to yourself if you got any like uh kiwi sports ideas or just feedback or just want to you know leave a comment on youtube leave a you know whatever on the podcast i don't know how you do that but um we're all here for our tero sport that's what we we just love our tero sport as you do so big it up to yourself stay beautiful in our tero it's pretty crazy you know no drama fuck the world we're just here in our tero just living it up living it up rooted to the earth grounded and liberated from time liberated from time Booyakasha. Check.